Well, hello, everybody. I'm Beaver Randolph. And I'm Ron. We are today going to continue a little bit with Nehemiah. Um, and a little bit of a, a backstory from what I understand. Yeah. This. In order to be able to understand what's going on right now in Jerusalem, uh, we'll have, we're will we going to do go back and get a little bit of the backstory. Some context. There you go. Exactly. Context. Makes it easier to understand for me because that's the way my brain works. Right. Uh, that's the way mine works too. I'm always getting lost sometimes whenever I read. But, <laughs> but yeah, let's uh, pray and get started. I'm excited. Okay. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and the healing and restoration that he's brought into our hearts, Father. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be here with us, Lord, that you would um, enlighten the word to us, Lord. Uh, Give us understanding, Father, and most importantly, we pray that those who listen be encouraged. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So we stopped uh, last time on uh, part three, we stopped at Nehemiah six fourteen, so we are going to start at Nehemiah six verse fifteen, and then we'll go through nineteen. But first, we're just going to going to look at these uh, first couple of verses. Jer- uh, Nehemiah six fifteen. So the wall was finished on the twenty fifth day of Elul in fifty two days, and it happened. When all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work because what God initiated in Nehemiah's heart at the very beginning, he brought to completion. And, and Nehemiah was always pointing towards, towards uh, God. You know, he, 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 God will fight for us. You know, about, he was talking about this great and awesome work. God, God will bring it about. And so he was always uh, encouraging him through this process that at every corner, the enemy is right there trying to stop it. Mm. Well, at this point, even the people around there, even the evil the evil nations and 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 our our witness that this work was done by our God. So, right there, God is publicly glorified for what He did. You know what I mean by yeah. by and in fifty two days. Yeah, it seems awful quick. You know what I mean. Yeah, if you look at those walls from any city from back then, I mean it wasn't a something you did in just a a week or two and, you know, built it, they were, I'm sure they took years, most of them, you know. You, you uh, look back and, and the condition of the walls, everything that they went through people wise with all the inward turmoil that they could get that done in 52 days. That was miraculous. That had to be God Yeah, because you're dealing with what? people yeah messed up people that you know are involved at this at 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 every, at every point you yeah. know but what gets me is that through this entire process Nehemiah is pointing to God he's pointing to God trust God trust God through this trust God he will even if our eyes don't see it and our ears don't hear it and all we're hearing is the attacks and all we're hearing is uh the conspiracies God will finish this yeah. And it's a cool picture of what God starts. To me, this is what I get out of that. This is showing me who God is. What he initiates, he finished mm-hmm. by his power, even with messed up people, even with messed up situations. So let's go to verse 17. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechemiah, the son of Era, and his son Jehonanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. 
Also, they reported his good needs, good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobias sent letters to frighten him. So I read that. Tobias related? <laughs> what? That don't make no sense. You know, Tobiah is, I mean, I didn't, I don't remember reading anything about this from in Nehemiah up to this point that, that the very people who are the enemies of this work are married to the, to the daughters in Jerusalem. Yeah. What, what is going, you know what I mean? How did that, Hmm. because automatically, I mean, it's, it's like everything is compromised. The yeah. leadership, if you're married to the enemies of our nation and these nations are trying to destroy our nation, why'd you hook up yeah. with them? Yeah. What happened? I mean, you're, you're married to the enemy. Yeah. Basically, that's exactly what it boils down to. You're married to the enemy. So I wanted to do a little backstory, go back and find out what what caused this or what, you know, what led to the condition or whatever. 500 years earlier, before this period of time, Moses predicted that this would happen, that the people would do this. 500 years earlier. So I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and I'll read it. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughters to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused greatly against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people's, for you were the least of all peoples. So he tells them, he lays it out way back with Moses before they go in. He's, t- he's telling them, don't do this. Don't do this. When you get, when you get to, to where your enemies are in your inheritance, destroy them all. Okay, so let's move now. I want to go to do a little farther back. Chapter 31, verse 14. And this is the Lord predicting Israel's rebellion. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting, that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and a pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Wow. So, 
So God knew these people were going to, he knew it. Yeah. He knew what they were going to do. You know, that they were going to forsake him. And he specifically told them, take out all your enemies without, with no mercy yeah. whatsoever. So now I'm going to go just a little bit forward to the book of Judges, because this is where they have come into uh, the conquest of, uh, of Canaan, of, of the Holy Land, of their inheritance. And when I was reading this, I mean, I had never, I had never really stopped and thought about this, but uh, when they get to Canaan and when, you know, before that God had drove out their enemies. So now it's kind of like, okay, you go to your inheritance and you drive out those enemies. Don't have any, any, uh, cause he told them what would happen if they mixed with them. Mm-hmm. He told them, and, and if you think about it, what the evils and all that stuff, the culture, the culture was just evil. You know what I mean? And and so they get here, and I'm going to start at Judges 1, Judges uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up indeed, and I have delivered the land into his hand. So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I will likewise go with the territory. And Simeon went with him. So they're rocking, and I'm not going to read through the entire chapter. And I, I encourage anybody listening to read chapter one and two of Judges because it's really, really good. But what stands out to me is that not one tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel did what they were supposed to do, which right. was to drive out their enemies. Yeah, None of them got it right. And you would think that Judah, you know, starting out, God sent them out first and they hooked up with Simeon. It's like, you help me and I'll help you. And boom, they're off. Well, they go through the, you know, and it, 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 it throughout the chapter, you know, they're going through the highlands and they're retaking these uh, uh, towns and cities. And Caleb gets his, uh, his allotment, his inheritance. I think the only one that got got it even partly right was Caleb because he went back to his inheritance and defeated the the giants. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. but the rest of them and even Judah, the, and they're going and they've you know destroyed this town and they've destroyed that town. And so in verse 19 of chapter one, so the Lord was with Judah and they drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Because they had chariots of iron. Isn't that weird? That's where they stopped. Yeah. And so it's like, to me personally, it's like when, when me and the Lord are rolling through the mountains, man, it's just, we're rolling, man. But when you get down into the valley and your eyes see that nine foot steel chariot, yeah. are you going to trust God or not? Yeah. And and so they they stopped there. And I still... I mean, after them seeing all the great things that God did, they stopped right there. And so then you go on in this in the the rest of the chapter, verse twenty one. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. Verse twenty three. The house of Joseph sent men to spy out. Uh, let's see. And so I'm sorry. Verse twenty seven. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. Uh, all of these tribes, the Asherites, Naphtali didn't drive them out. Amor, I mean, every, every single one of these, the tribes, none of them drove out their enemies. Yeah. And so here we go, 500 years later, this is the condition of Israel because of what they did. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because of their disobedience. So that kind of helps me better understand, oh, wow. And it also is kind of encouraging to me because God knew their hearts. God knows the heart of man. He knew that they, that they were going to disobey, but he still had a plan of redemption, of bringing them back from captivity. 
And that's what's happening right now in Jerusalem and the walls being restored and everything is they're coming back. But there are some unholy alliances in Jerusalem, you know, and, and, and uh, even Sanballat somehow, somewhere is, is married to somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. they're all com- compromised. There are all these unholy alliances. It's the... It's the result and the culmination of 500 years of not doing what God told you to do and what yeah. would happen, and it's happened in there. Mm. But now they're coming back. So uh, verse or chapter 7 of Nehemiah, now we'll come back up to where we are because it better helps us kind of understand what happened throughout history to bring them to the place where they are and what's happening right now in in, uh, Jerusalem in this time with Nehemiah. Verse 7, Then it was when the wall was built and I hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, and Hananiah the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I said to him, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut the bar and doors and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. So there's a major shift happening now. Now it's not just every Tom, Dick, and Harry can run up into Jerusalem over the walls and just, you know, hang out, whatever, free go, come, whatever. Yeah. That's ended. That's stopped. Now, for security reasons, because what? You want to know who's, you want to limit who's coming in for security reasons or you're, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. So now you can't come in at night and they want to know who's coming in and going out and they post a guard there. So you, you would have to say something really big is changing in Jerusalem and has changed since the walls were built. And now that the walls are built, the doors are hung. Well, we're putting guards at the door and we're going to see who can come in and who can come out. You know what I mean? And it needs yeah. to be done in the daylight. Why are the doors open in the daylight? Who's coming in and who's coming out? Verse 4 of chapter 7. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people, that they might be registered by genealogy, and I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. And he's going to go on. These are the people of the province who came back from captivity so there's a genealogy of, of people who had been taken off in captivity because of that disobedience way back when. So now it's like, if we can't find your name in this genealogy, then... You know, you're toast. You're, yeah. <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that kind of remind you of a symbolism to something else? Mm-hmm. The, the, the Book of Life... In in uh in Revelation, the Lamb's Book of Life, those whose names were found written in it. Yeah, well, that's kind of here because it's kind of a little bit. Hey, mm-hmm. you can only get into Jerusalem, uh, uh, have a part or an inheritance in Jerusalem if your name's found in this genealogy as pure. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? As pure. Yeah. So it's like. It's like there's a purification going on. Not just anybody can roll up in here and be a part. Something's going, there's a cleansing going down. And and if you think about it, it's 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 a heart issue. It's what it really boils down to, a heart issue and, and uh, an issue for the you know, people who had been compromised from way back when because of what God had told them was gonna happen, happened. So I kind of see the I kind of see the symbolism there with that, that the gates were only opened in the daytime and, you know, it's just, wow, you had to be, your name had to be in the book. They were, and I'm not saying to get in Jerusalem, all this, what I'm saying is 
the captives who had come back who had a rightful inheritance in Jerusalem and and the and and they were wanting of course to you know and, and, and yeah. if you think about it that sounds like me when I was a captive to the enemy and God had mercy on me and brought me back to his son Jesus you know yeah and my walls of salvation they're there but now the hard issues come in when you're dealing with the temple because what are you going to allow in and what are you not going to allow in because mm. obviously it's very serious to the point that you'll be worshiping their gods and become like their culture. Yeah. You know, yeah. if if you allow these if you allow this and and so I see the symbolisms, I see the message here and it's encouraging. What's encouraging is the condition of their hearts didn't stop God from, from didn't stop God's plan with yeah. them. He still had a plan to redeem them and bring them back from captivity to Jerusalem. Right. And the restoration that was going on there, Jerusalem, family by family, as they came back from captivity, rebuilt houses. It said in there that there were empty houses. So, so, uh, I, mean, I see it, you know, as I see that work of restoration, a beautiful and encouraging work that that God brought about. You know, in 52 days, they, they finished the walls. Yeah. That was a miracle, finishing in 52 days with people that were fighting him at every end, even, you know, mm -hmm. all, the, all the turmoil. And then come to find out that a lot of these letters and everything you've been getting from your enemy is related to, you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're related to a Jew, so what? What? That's an unholy covenant. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and any Jew that would that would marry with the foreigners and and et, et cetera, it was it, they were no longer pure. You know, they were no longer a, a pact, uh, a covenant with Satan, with mm -hmm. the enemy. So they were compromised. So that is our message for today and to break it down a little bit more and i wanted to go back and bring uh get a little idea of the backstory in order for us to be able to understand where we're at right now in nehemiah and what's happening because obviously something there's some big changes going on in in jerusalem when the walls have been rebuilt and now not just anybody can roll up in there yeah so with that, we pray, hope and pray that everybody be encouraged. Thank you for listening to us. And we are, uh, all of a sudden, I got caught up in that. Oh. <laughs> but Hope it didn't go too fast. No, you didn't go too fast. I. Uh, Do you have any questions or comments or whatever? Man, I mean, it's, I appreciate the, the, what I appreciate about this is the, um, the correlation to uh, how to apply it. Um, you know, because I've always had issues. I think I've said this before. I have issues like reading the Bible, like, okay, how do I apply this whole story, this parable, this, you know, yeah. whatever to, you know. Yes. And the way that you dispelled all this out really just, it was like, oh, wow. Okay, now I see how you can, you know, you can this, get something. From you can it. put, yeah, you can definitely get something very strong from it. And it's, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I, I can really read through this book and kind of glean all the little jewels and, and the little, yeah. you know, things out of it, you know? And, um, uh, so I, I really enjoyed that. I like ne I like Nehemiah that, that he's just a, a normal, a normal guy, yeah. you know, that, that he uh that it all started in his heart yeah you know and what i can take from it that i can ap apply in my own life as as god's doing this and in in my life um is to respond to look at how nehemiah responded and he was always pointing people to jesus mm -hmm. he was always pointing them to trust in his god and he was always encouraging them and that's even what his name means is Yahweh comforts. Mm. That's Nehemiah's name. Yeah. You know, and I, and the symbolisms, I mean, I see them all over the place and I'm like, well, is this just me? Like the whole cup deal. Yeah. Okay. He's a cup bearer. Well, Jesus in the garden about his cup 
you know, and that he knows he has to drink that cup because that cup is God's, God's will for his yeah. life. He had a little trouble with it. And even the disciples, he tells them, are you willing to drink the cup that I'm going to, that I'm going to drink? And they're yeah. like, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, you will drink that cup. So what's going, why, you know, there's, there's something there, Nehemiah being a cupbearer, Jesus having his cup. And even when it was prophesied in, in Isaiah, I believe it was, it said that he, he would have to drink the dregs of his cup mm -hmm. to the dreg, drink all of it. And the way I see that cup, that is God's purpose for every single one of us. We all have our cup, yeah. that, that purpose. And, and look what, what God did through Nehemiah's, just through Nehemiah's heart. And, and it's real simple. Does God re still restore? Yes. Okay, and then, yes. then then is it God's will for me to step out? And he and he trusted God, and he went to the king, and it's like wow, yeah. Where where his obedience and and asking God to do this, and where God showed up, and where they intersected, that's where this work began, man. Yeah. That's where this work was uh, began and finished. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it encourages me if he can do it through a Nehemiah, yeah, or or, or, or and and people who have and cause favor with the different had to be yeah i mean put I, together for that yeah i believe i believe like i've told you before i believe that when when we have surrendered our hearts given our hearts to the lord jesus christ then this work of restoration begins in us in our hearts through forgiveness and it just spreads and it mm -hmm. continues to spread throughout our our families even when we don't see it yeah. matter of fact we definitely don't see a whole lot because that was the condition, you know, yeah. that I looked at when I was in prison years ago and, and just everything was broken, Yeah, you know, and, and little by little over the years, God has restored those relationships. There's been healing. Most importantly, he is restoring my family to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm. And he, me being like the black sheep, the you know, of the family. I mean, they're like, whoa, man, if God can do it in that old thing, he can do it in anybody. You know what I mean? Right, right. So yeah. it's been a long, I trusted God though. I, I wanted him to restore my family. I was not cool with the condition of my family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The relationships and them, you know, not knowing the Lord. I want them to know the Lord. Yeah. I want them to, to come to know Jesus like I do. And so it's just continually you're rebuilding your own wall. Yeah. Around our, our, our family, you know, and I think God is doing that Yeah. right now in, in just one family after one family after one family, Yeah. you know, and he's restoring the hearts of the fathers to their children and the, uh, the hearts of the children to their fathers. Yeah. Those were the last, those were about the last words in the book of Malachi before it went silent for 400 years. Wow. And Malachi was the prophet prophesying during the times of Nehemiah. So th that kind of helps me understand that a little yeah. bit because I can look back to Nehemiah and I can see, oh, what well, this is happening. And then I can see what Malachi is saying and he's speaking the words of God. And we'll get into that later. But it's like, wow, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that work of restoration. And then what happens 400 years after Malachi? Jesus is born. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Messiah, the, you know, the, what has been prophesied, he's here now. Yeah. And so I think it's a beautiful picture. I think it really is. And I think people need to be encouraged going through this with all the different relations, all the just, you know, the life, man, yeah. and yeah. people, because it's not a pleasant experience whatsoever. No, for sure. You know, yeah. it's, it's wonderfully difficult. Yeah. <laughs> what that, it's wonderful it's difficult because yeah. we're people dealing with people so yeah. well with that said i hope everybody be encouraged yeah for sure i feel like i talk too much again <laughs> well no no i mean there's a lot that need to be said you know there's a lot that's still to be said i i gather and you know it's uh, just kind of keep gleaning and keep, you know, soaking it up and keep, you know, right. giving it back. In the next episode, we'll go from probably chapter eight on, you know, through the end. 
and then maybe after that look at look at Malachi and kind of see if I, if it'll be a little simpler to understand some of the prophecies in Malachi yeah. when you can understand what was happening in their time. Yeah. And and me being the literal thinker, it's easy for me to break things down like that into simple terms. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I don't understand all the, you know, all the, I yeah. don't, the words, you know, of some mm-hmm. of the, I mean, they're, I just, yeah. being a literal guy and you're talking about certain things that are flying around and this and that, you know, it's exactly. hard to understand. Exactly. <laughs> hard to get. Oh, I feel it. I feel it. Well, thank you, Ron. Well, thank you, bro. Every thank you, Lord. ounce of that. So, well, everybody, we will sign off. And uh, we will. So.